Good morning, Life Church, and uh, we just want to let you guys know that we're so thankful to all of you who are tuning in and watching our services digitally. Today, we're beginning a new nine-week sermon series where we're going to be taking a deep look into Nehemiah and leadership. We want to let you guys know that we actually have a PDF document that's attached in a link below this video that you're watching right now. And we think it'd be really helpful if you went ahead and took the time to print that out and you just had it at the ready uh, as you watched the message this morning. Um, we also want to let you guys know that we're beginning our 21-day fasting and prayer, and that's going to start on September 28th, and that's going to last through October 18th. Finally, we recently had a, a door open up to serve a, a school in our community really close to us, Desert Harbor Elementary. Uh, they actually just recently opened up uh, for in-person classes on their campus, and they have a lot of safety protocols in place, and one of those is that they're closing down their water fountains on the campus. And so because of that, they're in need of water bottles for the students. So what we're gonna be doing here at Life Church is we're gonna be holding a water drive to collect water bottles for those students. And so Desert Harbor Elementary, it's actually right next to uh, a park, Calbrisa Park, where we've held a lot of events. And so this is a perfect opportunity to serve someone who's so close to us and, and not just someone, but a lot of people. And so we're gonna be holding that, that water drive here at Life Church on Sunday mornings, and you guys can drop off water bottles anytime between 9 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings. We're gonna have a team of people here in the lobby watching and waiting for anyone to drive on by that's gonna have water bottles to drop off. They'll be more than happy to step outside, pick those up from you guys. And so we wanna thank all of you in advance who are gonna be able to, to do that for us, to do that for the students at Desert Harbor Elementary. Now at this time, uh, please join us as we enter into a time of worship before uh, we head into the message. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on our Savior, see the image of love, see His praises forever. Oh, we look to the sun. Tearing through the dead of night See the kingdom burst into color at the speed of light Freedom shaking up the atmosphere As the shadows fade into nothing as the day appears Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us, the everlasting hero, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior, see the image of love, sing His praises forever. Nation waking up to kingdom come. See the hope of heaven shining like a rising sun. Forever lifted up from death to life. There's no fear in love, no darkness in this endless life. Beyond the skies above, love reaching out for us. The everlasting one, Jesus our God. Oh, we look to the sun, set our eyes on the Savior. See the image of love, sing His praises forever, oh, we look to the sun. We look 
Good morning, Life Church. It is great to see you this morning. Today we're going to begin a brand new nine-week sermon series called Lessons on Godly Leadership. And this series comes straight out of the book of Nehemiah. I picked this series for three reasons. One, whether you realize it or not, you and I are all leaders. We are all leaders. The only question is, are you and I good ones? Are we good ones? And I believe that Nehemiah can help us with that. Second, come November, many of us at least are going to have the opportunity to honor the privilege and the responsibility to cast our vote for the President of the United States and for other officials. As we do, it's my thought and my prayer that we, each and every one of us, would seek the heart and the mind of God in pursuit of electing godly leaders. And then third, the third reason that we're doing this sermon series is we need it. We need it. We need godly leadership in this country. We need godly leadership in our, in our churches. We need godly leadership in our homes. We need godly leadership in our businesses. We need godly leadership throughout life. And that means that starts leadership, godly leadership starts with you, and it starts with me, and it goes all the way to the top. And so let's pray, and we'll get right into it this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence today, to allow your, minds and your, your mind and your heart to fill us and to overflow from us. So that, Lord, as we learn and we grow what it means to be a godly leader, the Lord, as that happens in each one of our lives, that, Lord, we would demonstrate your goodness in this world, and that, Lord, as that goodness is demonstrated, that your kingdom would be built. And as your kingdom is built, that you would receive all the glory for it. And, Lord, we need you to speak to us today so that we can be on that road to becoming the kind of leaders that you want each and every one of us to be. And so speak to us. Give us ears to hear and minds to conceive and hearts to receive the specific message you have for each and every one of us. And all God's people said, amen. As I mentioned today, we're starting a brand new sermon series called Lessons on Godly Leadership. And I want to begin with a verse out of Proverbs, Proverbs 28, verse 2. It says, a nation will be strong and endure when it has intelligent and sensible leaders. A nation will be strong and endure when it has intelligent, sensible leaders. Now, I want us to note the two words here, strong and endure, because those are the benefits of having intelligent and sensible leaders. In other words, those are the benefits of having good leadership. For example, a family will be strong and endure when it has intelligent and sensible leadership. A business will be strong and endure when it has intelligent and sensible leadership. A church will be strong and endure when it has intelligent and sensible leadership. A country will be strong and endure when it has intelligent and sensible leadership. The Living Bible puts it like this. It says, with honest, sensible leaders, there is stability. Stability. Friends, with all the rapid changes and upheavals in our world and in our nation today, there are a few things that we need more than stability, right? Stability comes from good leadership. That's why this week and throughout this series, we're going to spend our message, message time discovering the principles of godly leadership. And those, as they're found in the book of Nehemiah, which is one of the greatest leadership books, of course, in all the scripture, but also in all the world, it truly is. We're going to look at Nehemiah's examples, and we're going to learn principles of leadership together. And so this morning, I want to do two things. I'm going to lay the foundation by sharing the background of this book. And before I even do that, I think it's important that I give you six laws of leadership, six principles, if you would, that will help us understand why we're even doing this study. Number one, nothing happens until someone provides leadership for it. Nothing happens until somebody provides leadership for it. Friends, that's just the law of life. I mean, look at history. The civil rights movement was nothing until a man by the name of Martin Luther King came along and said, I have a dream, and he provided leadership for it. 
The NASA space program was nothing until a guy by the name of John F. Kennedy came along and said, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade, and we did. Marvel movie fans, think about this one. There would be absolutely no Marvel universe if a guy by the name of Stan Lee hadn't come along and created that universe, but he did. And the walls of Jerusalem would have never been rebuilt if a guy by the name of Nehemiah had to stood up and said, here I am, Lord, send me. Send me. Friends, here there's nothing happens until somebody provides leadership for it. Everything rises and falls with leadership, which is why most problems, hear this, most problems in our homes, in our churches, in our businesses, in our nation can be traced back to a lack of competent godly leadership. For example, the book of Judges, if you've ever studied that book, then you know that Israel goes through seven different cycles. Israel goes up and Israel comes down. It goes up and comes down. It goes up and comes down seven different times throughout that book. And in the last verse, Judges 21, 25, it says, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Why? It gives you the answer. It says, there was no king in Israel. Friends, there was no king. That means there was no leadership in Israel. And because of that, people were doing their own thing. And friends, when people do their own thing, it creates instability. Sound familiar in our country today? Friends, everything rises and falls with leadership. And that's why we need to train up godly leaders. Number two, leadership is influence. It's influence. If I was to summarize leadership into one word, it would be the word influence. Influence for good or influence for bad, because there are positive leaders and there are negative leaders, right? How many of us have actually gone to a playground? And within five minutes, as you watch those kids, you know exactly who the leaders are among those kids, for good or bad. You know who they are, right? Or you watch a group of teenagers, and within five minutes, you know who the leaders are. They're the ones with the most influence. And how many of us have ever sat in a committee meeting? And we figured out who the leader was, and often it's not the chairperson, but it's that person that everybody keeps turning to to find out what they think. Friends, every time you influence somebody, you are assuming leadership. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, Paul talks to Timothy here, and he says, as a young man, be an example in leadership. Friends, here this age has nothing to do with good leadership. You can influence people at any age. I still look to my mom, who's in her 80s, to guide me so that I can learn what it means to be godly in my 80s. Friends, you and I can model for others at any age, whether we like it or not. Which means that every single person that's listening to this message right now, you are a leader just in different areas. And so the issue is not, are you a leader? The issue is, are you a good one? Are you a good one? At home, at work, at school, when you're running around, you are a leader. The only issue is, are you a good one? Let me give us a biblical definition of a leader. A leader is someone with God-given ability and responsibility to influence a group of people to accomplish God's purpose for that group. Let me repeat that. A leader is someone with God-given ability and responsibility to influence a group of people to accomplish God's purpose for that group. Friends, Nehemiah is an outstanding example of this because he accomplished incredible things against incredible odds in a very brief period of time because he was a good leader. Number three, the test of leadership is this. Is anybody following Is anybody following? That's the test of leadership. And so if you want to know whether you're a good leader or not, it's very, very simple. Just look over your shoulder and see if anybody's following. Because the truth is, if you think you're leading and nobody's following, you're just taking a walk on your own. Jesus said in John 10, 27, My sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They follow me. 
How many of you would agree there, there is a huge difference between having a boss and having a leader, right? I mean, just because a guy or a gal has some kind of title or comes some kind of position doesn't mean that people are going to actually follow him or her. It doesn't work that way. Friends, leadership is influence. And so if you're not influencing anybody, it doesn't matter what your title is. It doesn't matter what your position is. You're not the leader. Now catch this. You might have the power and the authority to rise up and drive and push people. But hear this, you can only drive and push people so far. That's why dictatorships never last, because people will only be driven so far. But hear this, they can be led. They can be led to the very ends of the earth. The test of leadership is, is anybody following the fourth foundation of leadership is character. Character, not charisma. The fourth foundation of leadership is character, not charisma. You see, charisma may give you a jump start on something, but it takes character to actually build it and to sustain it. For example, and I hate to use this illustration, but I think it's one of the best that I can use. Down through time, there have been a lot of televangelists out there, haven't there, who have tons of, Tons of charisma. But through the years, what have we seen happen with a lot of those televangelists? They've bombed out. They've crashed and burned. Why? Because many of them, and friends, I really do hate to say this, because many of them are brothers and sisters in Christ, but we need to learn from this so that we don't do the same. Many of them have bombed out because of a lack of character. It's been said that reputation is what people say about you. But character is what you really are. It's what you really are. Dwight O. Moody put it like this. He said, character is what you are in the dark when nobody's looking. I'm going to say that again. Character is what you are in the dark when nobody's looking. Let me ask you, what are you in the dark when nobody's looking? The foundation of leadership is character. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, the Apostle Paul creates a list of characteristics to look for in a leader. And it's very, very interesting because not once, think about this, not once does he mention a seminary degree or anything like it. Not once. Why? Because leadership is not based on academics nor hear this, is leadership based on temperaments or personality types. For example, did you know that some of the greatest leaders in the Bible didn't have any kind of personality and temperaments that were the same? Remember the four temperaments that used to be taught all the time? Paul was a cleric. He was hard to move. He was a get-the-job-done kind of guy. Peter was a sanguine. He was bold and outgoing. Moses was melancholic. He felt things deeply, and because of that, he often got depressed while he was leading the children of Israel throughout the desert. And Abraham, he was a phlegmatic. He was steady. He was rock solid. You could count on him. My point is this. Each and every one of those great biblical leaders were as different as night and day. As night and day. And yet God used each and every one of them to build his kingdom. And he wants to do the very same thing with you and with me. Friends, ultimately, leadership has nothing to do with the personality type God gave you or the charisma you have. It has everything to do with your character. All great leaders have character. In the weeks to come, we're going to see that Nehemiah did some extraordinary things, not because of some special personality he was given, but because he had character, and his character gave him the opportunities to influence others in godly ways. For example, look at Hebrews chapter 13. There, 7 through 8 on your, on your outline. Remember, it says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way in life and imitate their faith. Friends, this passage gives us three characteristics of good godly leaders. First, it says they have a message worth remembering. Paul says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. They have a message worth remembering. Second, 
they have a lifestyle worth considering. Paul says, consider the outcome of their way of life. In other words, does their walk actually match their talk? Finally, they have a faith worth imitating. Paul says, imitate their faith. And so, friends, if you and I want to be good leaders first, we need to develop a message worth remembering. In other words, what does God want to say to the world through you and me? What does he want to say? Second, we need to have a lifestyle that's worth considering. So that when people look at us, they say, man, what is it about their life? And number three, we need to have a faith worth imitating that compels others to look at our lives, to see God, the image of God in us, and to follow in like kind. Friends, all of that is character stuff. It's character stuff. Leadership law number five. Leadership can be learned. Leadership can be learned. Friends, I am absolutely convinced of that. If I did not believe that, we would not be wasting our time right now talking about this stuff. The fact of the matter is, every single one of us can learn to become a great leader. I truly do believe that. Why else would the Apostle Paul write in Philippians 4, 9, whatever you have learned, note this, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. Friends, if leadership can't be learned, then, then why in Mark chapter four, 3, verse 14, Jesus, it says, Jesus appointed 12 that they should be with him. Why? To learn from him. To learn from him. Friends, leadership can be learned. Jesus knew it, Jesus understood it, and he built his ministry around it. How many times have you actually heard me say, Jesus ministered to the multitudes, but he poured his life into 12 men? Over and over again, why? Why did Jesus actually take these 12 guys and give them special attention? Think about that. Here's the leadership principle. Because Jesus invested maximum time with those who would bear the maximum responsibilities. Yeah, he ministered to the multitudes, but he spent most of his time training his leaders. Why? Because leadership can be learned. Principle number six. The moment you stop learning is the moment you stop leading. The moment you stop learning is the moment you stop leading. Friends, all leaders are learners. Write that down. All leaders are learners. Every leader is a learner. The moment you stop learning, you stop leading. Now, as leaders, we've got to keep developing, right? Keep growing, keep becoming what God wants us to be. And we're going to see that very thing in the life of Nehemiah. How God prepared him and used him and grew him because Nehemiah was willing to learn. Look at Ecclesiastes 10.10 there in your outline. It says, if the axe is dull and the edge unsharpened, more strength is needed. Now what's he saying? He's saying, come on guys, you know, if you're chopping wood and your axe gets dull, It's going to take a whole lot more time and energy to chop that wood than it would if you would just stop and be smart enough to sharpen that axe. And so work smarter, not just harder. You know, there are a lot of people who say, you know what, hard work brings success, right? You've heard that over and over again. But the truth is, I know scores of of people, and you do too, who have worked hard, but they're not very successful. They're not. Now, hear me. Don't get me wrong. I am not saying that leaders shouldn't work hard. They should. As a matter of fact, they should set the pace. They should lead the way. Friends, working harder is not near as important as learning to work smarter. In other words, sometimes you need to stop and you need to sharpen your axe. For example, when this building here that that I'm preaching in right now, when this building was built... How smart would it have been for the site manager to have his workers dig the foundation of this building by hand when he could just bring a backhoe in and do the work 20 times faster? How smart would that have been? Work smarter, not just harder. Leaders are learners, and they're constantly learning better ways to work smarter. That's why true leaders never say, I know it all. They never say, I know it all. Instead, they say, I want to learn. I want to grow. I want to become more of what God wants me to be. Which is why I want to challenge each and every one of us to weekly be a part of this series, this training time. 
because I believe this time will help you grow and me grow at work, at home, at church, with our families, in our schools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Friends, hear this. God has a place for you to serve, and he has a purpose for your life that involves influencing others for him. Nehemiah was called to influence his world by building a wall. You and I are called to influence our world by building bridges to others for Christ. Now, let's look at the background of Nehemiah's story here so that we can just hop into it next week when we get there. First, let's start with the when. The when. In 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. With that destruction, many Jews were taken into captivity and they were deported to Babylon, which is, of course, modern-day Iraq. They were supposed to be kept there for about 70 years. But in 537 B.C., the very first group of Jews were allowed to return back to Jerusalem. And in 516, the temple was rebuilt. In 458, Ezra led the second group of Jews back to Jerusalem. And then in 445, about 140 years after the Jews had been taken into captivity in Babylon, Nehemiah asked for permission to return to Jerusalem with the third group to help rebuild the city walls. Now, where is this happening? This story is happening primarily in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And what's the problem? The problem is the city of Jerusalem is in rubbles. The walls have been destroyed and the people are living in a junk heap. And there are two results. First, the people are defenseless. In other words, they have no, no protection at all from marauders and thieves. And second, because of that, they're discouraged, they're defeated, and they're depressed. Which, of course, is exactly the way their enemies wanted to have them be. You see, when an enemy army would come sweeping down into a city to take it over, the very first thing they would do would be destroy the city walls. Why? Because that would strip those people of their pride and of their protection. You see, the destruction of the city walls was parallel to saying, you're nothing. You're helpless, you're hopeless, you're dirt. We stomped on you and we're leaving you in your dirt, defeated and defenseless, with no walls to protect you. And so when Jerusalem's walls were torn down, God's people were defeated, they were defenseless, and hear this, they were disgraced. Disgraced because the whole world knew that their God had forsaken them. Now, how did they actually get carried off into captivity in the first place? Of course, that's another story, and it's this story. They got carried away because of the sin of the nation. Because of the sin of the nation. You see, God had come to them and said, guys, if you don't get your act cleaned up, if you don't straighten out and start going my way instead of your way, I'm going to allow an enemy nation to come sweeping down into Israel and destroy you. And sure enough, they didn't. And so he did. And so now years later, he's allowing the Jews to come back and the temple's been rebuilt. Not like it was, but it's been rebuilt. But the city is still in rubble. I mean, friends, it's a mess. It's just one great big giant junk pile, and the people are living in the rubble. They're defeated, they're discouraged, and they're depressed. Now, let me ask you, what do you and I need in a situation like that? What do we need? We need a leader, right? We need a good and we need a godly leader. Look at Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It says, the word of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Chislev, in the twelfth year, while I was at the citadel of Susa, and Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some of the other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those that survived the exile are back in the province, but they're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates have been burned with fire, which is, of course, very significant. There's no protection. When I heard these things, he says, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the Lord God. Then I said, and then he goes on to share a prayer that we're actually going to get into next week. Now, 
The first thing I want us to notice here about these verses is that Nehemiah wrote them himself. He says, I was in the city of Susa. Friends, this is his personal journal. It's his handwritten personal account as a leader. And so as in this account, we're going to discover how Nehemiah was able to get permission from a foreign king who wasn't a believer to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem when he himself, that foreign king, had actually been the very one who ordered the walls of Jerusalem not to be rebuilt. Friends, this is Nehemiah's personal journal, and we're going to get an inside view at this leader because of it. Second, I want us to note that Nehemiah was in the citadel of Susa. Now, hear me, Susa was not the capital of Persia, but it was like a, a summer palace, if you would. And so the story begins with Nehemiah in the king's summer palace in modern-day Iraq. And then, in the first part of verse 11, Nehemiah tells us, he says, I was the cupbearer to the king. Friends, that actually tells us what Nehemiah did for a living. He was the cupbearer. Now I know when you and I hear cupbearer, it kind of sounds like he was a dishwasher or best a butler, right? But the truth is a cupbearer had a very important and a very trusted position in that empire. You see, in that day, many historians believe that that was probably the second most important position in the entire kingdom. Because a cupbearer was kind of like a combination, if you would, of a prime minister, a bodyguard, a personal security agent, and an assistant to the king. And so by nature of this position, Nehemiah was one of the most trusted and one of the most important people in the entire kingdom. As a matter of fact, many historians believe that no one other than the king's wife was in a better position to influence the king. Now, the specific reason he was called a cupbearer was that because of part of his, top, his job was actually the taste of wine and taste of food before the king ever ate or drank. Why? Because, of course, one of the quickest and easiest ways to get rid of a king in that day was to take a little poison and slip it into his food or drink. And so the cupbearer was always the one to test it first. Friends, being a cupbearer was a dangerous, a dangerous job, yet it was also a very, very prestigious job. As a matter of fact, there are a number of people who would have died for that position. Yeah, nobody laughed. Yeah, I had to try that as a joke, but here's the real point of what I want to get to. To even be considered for this job, Nehemiah had to be absolutely trustworthy and loyal, especially since he wasn't even a Persian. Remember, he's a Jew. He's from a foreign land. His people were defeated and taken captive 140 years ago, and yet now... He's the second most important person in the greatest empire of his day. Friends, I don't know about you, but I find it absolutely awe-inspiring to see how God always has a way of getting his people into the right place at the right time. Nehemiah is a major figure in the Persian Empire. Now, let's look at the first verse. The first verse says, His brother Han and I, had been on a trip to Jerusalem, but now he's back. Friends, Jerusalem was anything somewhere between 800 to 1,000 miles from Susa, which means it would have taken at least five or six weeks of journey on a camel. And most of that would have been desert. And so we're talking about a very, very hard, hard travel. But now his brother's back. And in verse 2, Nehemiah says, hey, hey, bro, give me a report. What's going on with the family and all? What's going on with the friends back in Jerusalem? And Hannah and I says, Nehemiah, it's the pits. I mean, those that survived the exile, and of course not everybody did, but those that survived the exile are in trouble and disgrace. The walls have been broken down. The gates are burned. The city's in ruins. The people are discouraged and depressed. It's terrible. Nehemiah, it's absolutely terrible. And how does Nehemiah respond? Look at verse 4. He says, when I heard these things... I sat down and I wept. For days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. Nehemiah had four reactions. He wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. Friends, this, this thing, this news hit Nehemiah like a ton of bricks. It knocked him out of whack. It leaves him heartbroken, embarrassed, and saddened for his people. 
In fact, he actually says, for some days, note that, he says, for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed. In other words, he doesn't just mourn and fast and pray for a day. No, he actually starts in the month of Chislev. And then finally, in chapter 2, verse 1, it tells us in the month of Nisan, he finally gets his chance to speak to the king. Friends, that's four months. Nehemiah has been on his knees, maybe fasting, I don't know, but it may be fasting, but at least praying for four months until the time is right to speak to the king. Nehemiah is a man of prayer. There are actually 11 prayers recorded in this book which are more prayers than almost any other book of the Bible, and one of them we're actually going to cover next week. Now, why did God choose Nehemiah as a leader? I mean, think about it. Of all the people that God could have chosen to help the people of Israel rebuild their wall, why would God choose Nehemiah, a cupbearer, to a pagan king? Well, there are at least three reasons. First, I think God chose Nehemiah because Nehemiah was sensitive to the needs of others. He was sensitive to the needs of others, which actually is quite incredible given the circumstances he found himself in. I mean, think about this. Nehemiah had it made. I mean, he is at the peak of his career. He's living on easy street in the most powerful empire of the day. He's got the second best position and he's got a great salary. He doesn't need to rock the boat. And besides, the problems in Jerusalem must have seemed like a million miles away. And yet when he hears that God's people are depressed, they're discouraged, and they're defeated, it breaks his heart. He's sensitive to the needs of others. Now, in the weeks to come, every time we see one, I'm going to give us a little leadership insight. And here's the first one. Leaders are sensitive to to the needs of others. Say that with me. Leaders are sensitive to the needs of others. That's the first principle of leadership I want to bring out of this book. Now, I think most of us know this intellectually, right? We know this. But living in the U.S., even in the time of coronavirus, is a cakewalk. It's a cakewalk. But... You know, because we think, oh, we got coronavirus. Well, so does the rest of the world. Only piled on top of them, much of the world is also asking, am I going to have any food to eat today? Or what about tomorrow or the next day or the next day or the next day? Or am I going to have any clean water to drink? Not just today, but what about tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day? Friends, we don't worry about that kind of stuff. No, we worry about whether we're going to have to keep wearing our mask or whether we have to keep socially distancing or whether our shoes are going to match our clothes. Friends, as Americans in general, we are so insulated and isolated from the problems of the rest of the world, we don't relate to them. We don't. It's kind of like John Lennon's old song, A Day in the Life. I don't know if you remember that song, but he says something like this. He said, I read the news today. A guy took his life, and everything burned up. And oh no, I burnt my toast. Friends, he's talking about how easy it is to end up disconnected and disassociated from the true needs and the true concerns of others. The point I want to make is this. The people that God uses are the people who care about the things that God cares about. Say that with me. The people God uses are the people that care about the things that God cares about. Friends, hear this. God cared about the fact that the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down and that his people were discouraged and defeated and depressed. And because God cared about it, Nehemiah cared about it, and that made him a great leader. Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, used to say, Lord, let my heart be broken with the things that break your heart. And God did. And Bob Pierce started World Vision. Friends, the very first step to becoming a great leader is to have a sensitivity to the needs of others. Second, I think God chose Nehemiah because Nehemiah was dependable. He was dependable. Friends, he had a proven track record. In fact, the king considered him so trustworthy 
that he gave him the second most important position in the entire kingdom. He was a cupbearer, and as a cupbearer, don't forget this, the king literally entrusted his life to him daily, meal by meal. The point I want to make here is this. God uses, God uses people who are trustworthy. He uses people who are reliable. He uses people that are dependable. Nehemiah was dependable, and God used him. He used him. Number three, Nehemiah was available. He was available. Now, one of the things I really like about Nehemiah is that the situation needed a leader, right? It needed a leader. And when he needed a leader, he didn't pop up and say, oh, you know what? Hey, God, why don't you take him? No, he stepped up to the plate and he said, hey, God, send me. Send me. Friends, think about this. Nehemiah had Mr. Cushy job, a position everybody else wanted, and the problem literally was a thousand miles away in Jerusalem. But he jumps up and says, send me. I'll do it. I'm not even a contractor, but I'll do it. I'll go rebuild a wall. And you know what? God chose him. Even though he didn't have the skills for that particular job. Why? Because Nehemiah had three things that were more important than those particular skills. He had sensitivity, he had dependability, and he had availability. Here's the point. God is not so much looking for ability in leaders as he is looking for sensitivity, dependability, and availability. Let me repeat that. God is not so much looking for ability in leaders as he's looking for sensitivity, dependability, and availability. Hear this. Those qualities, do not miss this, those qualities are not a matter of giftings. They are a matter of choice. Choice. You say, well, Derek, I don't have certain gifts or talents, or I don't have a certain intellect, or I don't have a certain whatever. You know what? None of that matters. It doesn't matter to God. What matters to God is do you have character? Are you growing in character? Are you sensitive to people? Are you dependable? Can God and others actually count on you? Are you available? Or is it, you know what, God? You know, I'd really like to serve you today, but could we do it sometime between 5 and 5.30 so I can get to my tennis lessons? Before we close, let me remind you that nothing happens until somebody provides leadership for it. That everything rises and falls on leadership and that God wants to use you as a leader in your work, in your home, in your church, in your neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. And if you'll stick with me over these couple of months as we go through this series, and if you'll come with an open and a teachable heart, we're going to be looking at principles that are going to enable you and me to become truly godly leaders. As we close... I want to give you and me this little evaluation. Number one, am I sensitive? Am I sensitive to the needs around me? Ask yourself that question right now. Am I sensitive to the needs around me? Or am I so caught up in my plans and my desires, I can't hear God's voice? Am I sensitive? That's why God chose Nehemiah. Am I aware of my wife's greatest needs? My husband's greatest needs? My my kid's greatest needs? Am am I aware of what people, the needs are with the people I work with? Or what are the greatest needs in the life of my church? Could I even name all those things, right? Do I even care? Friends, what breaks your heart? Think about what truly, what truly breaks your heart? Does wearing a mask and social distancing upset you more than the fact that there are people all around the world that are dying of starvation, dying of polluted water, AIDS, coronavirus, and other diseases? Or does it accept you more that there are people right now that are living right down your street who are dying? Think about this. Are you more upset about the whole corona thing, or are you more upset about the people down your street who are dying emotionally, relationally, and spiritually because no one, maybe even yourself, no one, Loves them enough to bless them, to pray for them, to listen to them, to encourage them, to serve them, to share God's love and message with them. Let me ask you, what actually breaks your heart? Friends, if you want a heart like God, then pray that God breaks your heart with the things that break His. 
How about dependability? Can actually, can you be dependent on, are you truly reliable? What about availability? Are you available to God? Are you available to be used in any way he wants, at any time he wants? Do you want to be? Do you even want to be? If so, I want to invite you to pray this one sentence prayer with me. First, I want you to listen to it. Check it with your heart. And then I'm going to repeat it. And then if you want to pray with me, you can. Here it is. Just listen. God, I want to be willing to be used by you anywhere, anytime, any way, for anything. If that one sentence prayer expresses your heart, I want to invite you to pray that with me out loud right now. Ready? Repeat after me. God, I want to be willing to be used by you anywhere, anytime, any way, and for anything. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it, and friends, hang on for the adventure of your life because there is no greater thrill than being used by God to actually build his kingdom. Now I want to close this with this prayer. Pray with me. Father, may each and every one of us, may each and every one of us be challenged by the life of Nehemiah. Yeah, the principles are thousands of years old, but Lord, they apply to each and every single one of us right here and right now. And Lord, I want to be sensitive. I want to be dependable. And I want to be available for you. God, by your grace and for your glory, let that be so in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Before we close, I want to give us four different ways to respond. First today, if you prayed either of those prayers or maybe both of those prayers, I want to encourage you to go to our prayer wall on the website and tell somebody, just post it there which leads us right into the second way to respond. And that's if you want to receive prayer for yourself or for others. And it doesn't have to have anything to do with what we've been talking about today. But if you have something you want others to be praying with, when two or three are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. Go to our prayer wall on the website. The prayer team, I promise you, because I get those every single day. We monitor that every single day. We pray for those requests every single day when they're posted. Third, another way you and I can respond to this God who loves us and cares for us is to give back to him. To give back to him with our time and our talents and our treasures. And there are two ways right now, if, if you're at home watching this, that you can give your treasures. One is to go to our website and you can give there. Or you can give by check and the address is below me, but I'll send it to you. I'll, I'll say it for you anyway. It's Life Church of the Northwest Valley, 8765 West Kelton Lane, Building B3, Suite 140. Peoria, Arizona, 85382. And it should be on the screen right there for you too. And then fourth and finally, I want to remind you that we are still doing our food drive and we're going to continue to do that food drive as long as there are people in need. So you can drop it off or pick it up right now from 9 to 1130 this morning. And once again, if there's somebody you know that needs it, just come. We'd be glad to share that with you so you can share it with them to be able to bless them in the name of Jesus. Now as you go, I want to encourage you to live like Jesus and love like Jesus and share his message everywhere you go. Because when you and I do that, it brings life to our family, to our friends, to our neighbors, and to our world. And so God bless you as you bless others.